at the facility level as well as the community level. So the focus today again is on differentiated service delivery models for children and adolescents, something very dear to our hearts. Um, and in a minute I will um, hand over to Martina from WHO who will talk a little bit more about H3 and the webinar series as well as the significance of the uh, DSD models for children and adolescents. But before I hand over to her, maybe we can go to the next slide which shows the agenda. Um, we will hear first uh, from Anna uh, about key policy evidence and gaps uh, in the, the DSD models. Uh, we then hear from Katrine and Alan, specifically uh, the work we've done within ECFAF and Malawi. Um, then we'll hand over to our PACFAR colleague, Hillary, to give us a stakeholder's perspective, and uh, hopefully we will have sufficient time left at the end to have a facilitated discussion uh, organized by Jen, and we also have one of our Kaya members, um, Samanda, joining for that session. Um, so without further ado, I would like to hand over to you, Martina. Oh, sorry, no, one more thing. Sorry, one, one more slide, next slide. Uh, some logistics. Uh, as uh, you might be aware, everybody uh, will be automatically muted so that we don't have enough, and uh, we don't have a lot of background noises. But we are very interested in your questions or comments, so if you join uh, by computer, please use the Q&A box that's uh, on the bottom of your screen, type in your questions or comments, and they will be brought to the attention of the moderator and will be addressed during the discussion part. And if you join by phone, please uh, press star 9, um, and it will raise your hand, and so we will be able to um, unmute you. If you have any further questions, um, you can see here at the slide at the bottom who you need to contact uh, for those questions. So with that, I hand over to you, Martina. Thank you very much, Anya. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And I want to start by thanking the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation for convening and facilitating this webinar as part of the AIDS Free Working Group webinar series. Uh, as you know, WHO and ECPAF co-chair the AIDS Free Working Group, and we have a common goal to really facilitate the global collaboration and the urgent actions that are needed towards reaching the treatment targets for children and adolescents living with HIV. As part of that, we have focused our work on a few thematic areas, and we see service delivery as a critical one of those because we believe firmly that um, the best tools cannot achieve the impact that we need unless they are delivered in the appropriate way to the population that we are trying to target. So this webinar series uh, was uh, started about a month ago with the first webinar on adolescent health friendly services. And um, this series has the goal really to help us to review the normative basis of some of the service delivery models that are uh, seen to be um, to be important for country programs. But most importantly, we would like this series to really help us to hear more from those of you on the ground that are testing and implementing this service delivery model to try to have uh, really the lesson learned and any reflection that um, uh, you, are, uh, you are generating as part of the implementation work that you're leading. As you know, in 2016, WHO made a clear move to promote a differentiated approach to service delivery, recognizing that uh, services need to be tailored to the individuals, allowing for more decentralization, more task shifting, and even more uh, less frequent uh, visits, as well as uh, different type of models uh, depending on the um, individual. We know that this is particularly important for children and adolescents. And despite that, we know that implementation of DSD models for children and adolescents has lagged a little bit behind because often these subpopulations are still recognized as being vulnerable and difficult to manage. However, we know that many of you on the ground have really uh, piloted and, and implemented a number of models that do reflect the, some of the concept and key principles of DSD. And so the purpose of the webinar today 
is really to hear from you and to be able to really um, uh, take note and reflect on some of the early lesson learned out of these implementation efforts. Um, so you, we've, on, we've gone through the agenda already. And so um, without further ado, I would like to maybe hand over to the next presenter uh, that, will, uh, that is Anna Grissom from um, the uh, International Aid Society that will really give us set the scene with uh, uh, summarizing key policy evidence and gaps in differentiated service delivery for children and adolescents. Over to you, Anna. Thanks, Martina, um, and, and thanks to both WHO and AGPAF for the opportunity today. Um, I'm also going to note that um, thank you for, to the 59 attendees so far, and thanks everyone for joining on time. I feel as though I might actually get an extra two minutes from how well we've done in terms of tech and going through all the logistics. So as mentioned, I'm going to give a brief kind of introduction um, to this uh, webinar today, talking about policy and evidence and gaps. Um, and I'm really going to focus on this exclusively from a DSD perspective and um, talking about children and adolescents in terms of the population. So this is kind of a common definition that we have used and that people have seen to describe what is differentiated service delivery or DSD. Um, and I think what's really important here is to acknowledge these words that we've put in bold. So this is really client centered. So focusing on the person living with HIV in this instance, and it's something that applies across the cascade. And while we acknowledge that this is client centered, we also know that most people living with HIV are living in resource constrained environments and are accessing healthcare in health systems that may not be um, fully resourced. And so we also want to acknowledge that and try and reduce unnecessary burdens on the healthcare system. And so this becomes a little bit of our balancing act. So today, we, I'm going to say that we definitely acknowledge that differentiated service delivery applies across this HIV care continuum. So different ways of people accessing prevention, accessing testing, accessing treatment, and ensuring viral suppression. But most of what the presenters are going to talk about today and most of what I'm going to talk about is really kind of focused on the second 290s. So looking um, at how we support people to stay retained in antiretroviral therapy programs and how we support them to have sustained viral suppression. So looking at kind of the tail end of the cascade. Um, as Martina alluded to, I'm going to start by going through some of the policies that exist. Um, building off of the 2016 WHO guidelines, um, WHO together with partners published this key considerations document. Um, and I've hyperlinked um, the things that are uh, projected so that you can look at this later. But this is a document that really describes why we need to ensure that differentiated ART delivery is something that everyone can access. So we wanted to make sure that this isn't something that is just for adults, that is just for one geography, that is just for one population. And so this document was meant to really highlight that these other populations shouldn't be excluded on any singular basis. Um, the WHO guidelines also say this, and they say that these also apply to children and adolescents and also apply to key populations. Um, but this document really makes it explicit. Further and, and highly relevant to this population, and I know um, in the slides that are forthcoming, uh, Hillary will speak about this as well, is that in principle, we really want to make sure that these services are family centered and acknowledge that children and adolescents live within a, this context. And so that we need to um, make sure the way in which we're providing services acknowledges that. So if you go through the key considerations, what they outline is the building blocks of service delivery for children and adolescents. And when I say building blocks, I'm meaning they talk about when people should get services, where they should get them, who should be providing them, and what the package should entail. And so as part of the annexes and the key considerations, this is laid out very explicitly for younger children, those ages two to five, um, older children, those aged five to nine, and adolescents, those aged 10 to 19. And so you get the building blocks or the when, where, who, and what for frequency, um, location, provider, and package of care for ART refills, for clinical consultations, and also psychosocial support. And this is done very intentionally and very literally 
to acknowledge that these different populations may have a different kind of combination of building blocks that make sense for those sorts of services. So for example, from, from the age of five, it's a, there's an acknowledgement that you may want to have um, ART refills that are given every three monthly, for example, but you might want to only require a clinical consultation every six months and then psychosocial support to complement and ensure that there's both a safety net and people there that can be accessed outside of those intervals. So really looking at art refills, clinical consultations and psychosocial support. Um, the other documents that was published simultaneously with the key considerations was a decision framework that really looked at how to make those key considerations come to life. And so in this document highlighted here in green, we really have outlined the background principles to DSD as well as showcasing a menu of examples. So really trying to spotlight many of the work of, of partners, of communities, of implementers that have done this work already in terms of making ART delivery differentiated for children, adolescents, and pregnant and breastfeeding women. And also what this document emphasizes is how you may want to adapt models or adapt services to do this. So for example, what you might want to do if you already have differentiated ART for adults, what you might want to consider for these populations, or if you already have services being provided, for example, for adolescents, how you may want to leverage that model to also include things like ART refills so that um, you're not starting from scratch, but rather adapting systems that are already in place. We talk about really four different types of models of differentiated ART delivery, they're outlined here. And what's important is that we have examples of all of these models for children and adolescents. So we have examples of healthcare worker managed groups, such as um, teen clubs or adherence clubs. We have examples of client managed groups for this population, such as community art groups for families. We have examples of facility-based individual models, so where people are fast-tracked to receive an ART refill on days when they don't require a clinical consultation. And we also have examples of out-of-facility individual models, and these include things like mobile outreach, um, ART collection from community or private pharmacies, or direct home delivery of ART refills. Um, and just to say that the way these are outlined in this document in terms of examples and the way we really have encouraged many people to start thinking through their own models is by outlining it with these building blocks. So thinking about when, where, who, and what, your ART refills, your clinical consultations, and your psychosocial support are provided. And acknowledging that this package of what's included, who's providing it, when and where it's happening may be different. So looking at um, adolescent groups in Zimbabwe, there's a difference between the frequency of their ART refills and clinical consultations. And there's different providers that support this. So obviously for clinical consultations, we wanna make sure that there's someone who is a clinician, but for ART refills, this could be done by a peer provider or a lay health worker. And that psychosocial support also could use different cadres of staff. Um, in the next couple of minutes, I just wanna highlight a few places where we see some gaps, um, gaps in policy, gaps in implementation, and then thoughts to all of you to hopefully prompt some discussion for later on on how we can close those gaps. So the first is that I think for some of us, especially in the kind of global space, we need to do a better job of understanding how DSD relates to the concept of adolescent friendly health services and how that further relates to the idea of adolescent peer providers. And I say this because it's very easy for many of us to kind of talk in acronyms as well as kind of talk within these schools of thought. And there's definitely an area of overlap between these concepts, but they are also different. And so I think we should do a better job at um, expressly describing how these things fit together and how they don't. In terms of gaps um, between evidence and implementation, um, from an evidence side, we've got some good evidence uh, around longer ART refills, teen clubs, youth clubs, and family-centered care. Um, but we could do with better evidence on costing and longer-term outcomes. From a policy perspective, as Martina mentioned, this has been in WHO policy since 2016, but we've seen slower uptake of differentiated ART delivery for children and adolescents than we have for adults. Um, and so we've had other um, forums in which we've tried to advocate 
for this. Um, and what I've highlighted here is one of the um, AIDS-free working group policy briefs that focused on this as well, um, trying to kind of nudge countries to um, think about DSD for children and adolescents. And then from an implementation side, I think that we have gaps around um, ensuring that providers across all cadres um, are kind of comfortable and start to um, acknowledge and enable um, more uh, client self-management and family self-management and to see whether or not these models for children and adolescents can become part of standard of care and not just something that are done through our partners. Um, and that we also make sure that we don't um, forget that children and adolescents are part of family units. And so we might differentiate ART delivery for parents or caregivers, but if we don't think about their family as a unit, the gains in terms of efficiency for the adults won't translate into gains or improvements in terms of quality of care for them as a group or for their children and adolescents. So this was just a slide to show you a bunch of the evidence and make sure that you have a place where you can go and read more. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight here that we see there is a very uh, varied uptake in terms of policy um, by age. And so this is something that a few of us are working on, um, and you'll see this in other presenters in different kind of formats, is in the countries where we have national guidelines around differentiated ART delivery and eligibility, many of them do actually have different age limits um, into different uh, models or into different ART refills. And so we still have work to do uh, from a policy perspective. Um, and then finally, we do see some um, huge successes in terms of scale up. So this was just to show that same Zimbabwe model and how it's at scale in other countries. Um, but it's not necessarily something that's at scale across sites, meaning that we know that there's many children and adolescents who may not have access to these um, models. So in conclusion, I'm hoping that all of you are joined uh, this call today because you are advocates yourself and, and you are the choir and you have interest in terms of promoting this within your colleagues and within your um, networks. So we need to kind of continue this push for family centeredness and we've seen a lot of talk about this in the peer reviewed literature. Um, we need to make sure that people are not excluded just based on their age, um, that this is not something that um, should eliminate someone from access immediately. You can be clinically stable and, and under 20 years old. Um, and we need all of you to tell us more about what you're doing so we can spotlight and showcase this to the various people who think it's not happening. Um, and so in conclusion, I hope that you'll share more with us um, on this website that we uh, manage. Um, differentiatedservicedelivery.org um, so we can keep um, moving this work forward. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks so much, Anna. My name is Jennifer Cohn. I'm the Senior Director of Innovation for the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, and I'm going to be moderating the call for today. Um, just as a reminder, as Anya mentioned earlier, we'll hold discussion until the end of all the presentations, but at any time you can type your questions or comments into the comment box. So our next speaker um, will be Katrin Alans, who is the Associate Director of the EGPATH Technical Leadership and Program Optimization Team. She'll be speaking about differentiated service delivery models for treatment and care of children and adolescents across different EGPATH programs. So Katrin, over to you. Um, thanks, Jen, and good morning, everyone. Um, Sarah, I'm trying to see how I can move the slides, but for some, okay, there we go, I think. Okay, and otherwise maybe you want to keep them moving, Sarah, if I don't manage. Thank you. So as Jen said, I will talk about the implementation of differentiated service delivery models for treatment and care of, uh, of children and adolescents in ECPOF supported countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, recognizing that some differentiated care models specifically for children and adolescents were already being implemented to some extent um, for some time um, and the need to develop new uh, or refine existing models to improve outcomes we felt we needed to better understand what was actually happening on the ground so I would talk about uh, an assessment that we did of DSD models um, and what we found 
and then provide a bit more detail about some of these models. And then after that, Ellen from Malawi will talk more in depth about DSD for children and adolescents um, in Malawi specifically. Next slide. So we collected information about DSD for children and adolescents implemented between 2017 uh, through March 2019. I rece received information from seven countries, um, including Eswatini, Kenya, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, Tanzania, and Uganda. And then we asked our teams in these countries about any models implemented that included children and adolescents. And then uh, following the building blocks, uh, of the DSD framework described by Anna, we asked them to describe um, patient eligibility for enrollment, uh, the location of service delivery, interventions included in the DSD model, uh, the health cadre delivering the care, and then frequency um, or timing of care delivery. Then we also collected information on the scale of implementation in terms of number of sites, and we try to get information on the number of children and, or adolescents enrolled in the model. And finally, we uh, mapped the DSD models, uh, uh, implemented against the DSD model, uh, policies um, in each country. So this table summarizes the models that were implemented in these seven countries. And while the details of implementation in terms of eligibility who provided the services and the content of services varied by country. Um, these were the broad categories of models implemented that we found. Most models implemented were uh, facility-based. Um, individual facility-based models included multi-month refills, weekend clinics, and school holiday clinics. Then group-based models um, also implemented at facility level included clubs for children and adolescents, as well as family-based care models. And there were a couple of countries that offered community-based AIT models uh, that also included children and adolescents, but these were primarily community AIT outreach models. We saw var variation in eligibility criteria. For example, um, with regards to multi-month refill, um, some countries included children over 10 years of age, while other countries also included children over five or even over two years of age. And then also some models were combined. Um, for example, the school holiday clinics in Kenya, Uganda, and Lesotho also offered uh, multi-month refills. And then teen clubs implemented in each of the seven countries um, were um, or might be offered on a monthly basis, but it could also be coordinated uh, to align with the multi-month refills. And then we also saw variation with regards to the design um, of the children and teen clubs in terms of eligibility content. Um, and we found difference also between formal eligibility as, uh, and actual enrollment. Next slide. Um, so this slide summarizes the policy landscape overlaid with actual uh, implementation. And Anna already highlighted the fact that there's some difference between uh, what the policy allows at times and implementation. Uh, as you can see here, there's several models implemented in the absence of policy. For example, weekend clinics um, are implemented in Eswatini, Kenya uh, and Lesotho, even though not included in the policy guidelines. Similarly, school holiday clinics in Lesotho. And then conversely, some models were not implemented yet, even though included in the policies. Um, for example, um, while the policy guidelines include stable children and adolescents uh, in community-based ART models in some countries, at the time um, of our assessment, these were not implemented. Um, next slide. So we also asked information about the scale of implementation. This graph shows the coverage of DSD models for children and adolescents across active sites. Um, for each DSD model, um, the site level uptake um, for children and adolescents varied greatly. Um, few models were implemented at 100% of sites, and some models were only implemented at a few sites. Next slide. 
So um, now a couple of examples with a bit more detail. Um, first, this is an example from Eswatini. Um, the family-centered care model is designed to improve ART initiation, retention, and viral load suppression. And uh, the model is currently being evaluated in children under 15. In this model, the family is seen together to receive their care and counseling services um, as described in national guidelines. Um, in the study that's under evaluation, at least one other family member is ATP positive. However, in the um, family um, centered care program, the other family member can be HIV negative. Um, this was done to cater to children who are OVC and do not have any other HIV positive family member. HIV negative family members coming for care, they receive non communicable disease services. Um, already, the family centered care model has been modified to allow families to be seen together during school holidays uh, to accommodate all the children. Um, while we don't have yet results of the study um, with regards to viral suppression and retention among children under 15, um, we hope that this will be um, soon available. Uh, but qualitative results indicate that clients um, and healthcare workers like the model. Um, perhaps most importantly, the model encourages disclosure of HIV status among family members and also to the child and um, this improves family support and reduces stigma within the family and also um, it has improved communication between healthcare workers and families next slide um, as i mentioned children or teen clubs were implemented in all seven countries in some shape or form um, in many EPOF supported countries, uh, these clubs are named Ariel Clubs in legacy to Elizabeth Claes's daughter Ariel. Uh, here's an example from Tanzania from a SIF funded project where adolescent friendly services with adolescent adherence clubs uh, were implemented in 50 health facilities. So Ariel adherence clubs are facility based support groups. Um, they are often take place on a Saturday, so children don't need to miss uh, school. Services include retention and adherence support, as well as support for caregivers, along with clinical services, including ART refills, um, lab monitoring, and other clinical care. In terms of impact, we saw that adolescents, adolescents attending these clubs had better early retention, and um, they were also more likely to be on ART at six months. We also saw that um, adolescents attending these clubs were more likely to have their viral load taken. However, um, in terms of longer term outcomes, we did not see a difference in viral load suppression uh, yet. Um, but this has to be understood in the context of still suboptimal uptake of viral load. Um, also, participants of adherence club tend to be children who started ART at a younger age, while adolescents um, were less likely to enroll in adolescent clubs. Um, this suggests that we need to better adapt the clubs to the different needs of adolescents. And in fact, um, exciting work is already ongoing in a couple of countries where the clubs are adapted to different subgroups, such as um, adolescents moving to a transition to adult care, um, those with challenges uh, achieving viral load suppression, and pregnant teens. Next slide. Finally, here's an example of a model uh, uh, designed for adolescents uh, specifically. This model was adapted from the DC-based red carpet program, uh, which was designed to ensure individuals newly diagnosed with HIV are seen by a provider right away. Um, this program has been designed with input from adolescents and is implemented in 50 health facilities in Homa Bay, um, a high prevalence region in Western Kenya with the goal to ensure linkage to care and early retention for HIV infected adolescents. And some um, earlier results were published in 2017. Um, at the facility level, adolescents receive a FIP card for fast track access to care. And care includes peer support and flexible hours. Um, also, the program works closely with secondary, secondary boarding schools um, where uh, after training of staff and youth advocates, advocates adolescents uh, living with HIV receive treatment and adherence support services, uh, including sexual reproductive health counseling, 
Uh, they also receive support for storage of medications, uh, linkage to facilities. And then there are health clubs for students um, to address stigma among students. And then there's also a hotline uh, called One to One. This is a toll-free line operated daily by youth-friendly counselors and healthcare workers. Um, and adolescents can ask any questions regarding their health or speak to a counselor who also refers them to a designated health facility. And they, uh, the teams also follow up um, with any callers um, afterwards. Um, so comparing baseline data with intervention data in the initial pilot, we found improved linkage to care as well as improved early retention uh, in care. Next slide. So a, a number of lessons learned uh, as a result of this uh, assessment. Um, first, with regards to monitoring and evaluation, um, we found that it was very challenging to get data regarding enrollment onto DSD. Um, during the adoption of DSD, initially no adequate m and tools were put in place to uh, monitor enrollment and um, evaluate patient outcomes under the various mo models in general um, was difficult. Um, except for those implemented as studies. Um, to be able to uh, do so, adequate tools need to be put in place, including those that include disaggregated data to assess outcomes for children and adolescents. Um, on the other hand, though, uh, models that are proven to work should be scaled up rapidly beyond the initial few sites. And then if it's truly to be patient-centered, it's critical that models are designed with input from children and adolescents themselves and systems are put in place to obtain um, feedback. And um, I'm glad that um, we have a Kaya member who will um, talk a little bit about that later on. And then, um, and much uh, in line with what Anna said earlier already, despite broad adoption of DSD models, there are still several gaps. Um, as we've seen from the policy landscape, there are several models that are being implemented and seem promising, but they're not included in the policy guidelines. Also, the age range for eligibility can be more inclusive. Um, for example, multi-month refills uh, starting at two years of age is not included in all guidelines. Um, Community-based models hardly include children and adolescents. And also it's become evident that um, while a significant number of HIV infected adolescent girls are only identified when they are pregnant, uh, their specific needs are not adequately addressed in current programs and policy gui guidelines and program implementation should address this need. Next slide. So um, to conclude, um, to meet the needs of children and adolescents, um, a range of models are implemented across our country programs already and they continue to be adapted as we learn what works. Um, the findings also have demonstrated that it's feasible and that there's potential to do, reduce the burden for children, adolescents and their caregivers um, and also for service providers. Um, and further expanding, adapting and refining these DSD models for children and adolescents um, is critical to improve the quality of HIV care and treatment outcomes for children and adolescents. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much, Katrine. That was a really great overview. Um, we'll now actually have a deeper dive into one program example from Malawi. <clears throat> so with us today is Alan Ahimbiswapi, um, who is EGPAF's uh, Malawi Technical Director, and he'll be speaking about EGPAF Malawi's experience with DSD implementation for children and adolescents. So thanks again for being with us today, Alan. Uh, thank you, Jen. Um, I will share Malawi's experience uh, regarding DSD implementation for children and adolescents. Like Anna said earlier on, I think my main focus will be on um, uh, the, the third 90. Um, so I think I'm trying to move the slides. Uh, Sarah, maybe you remove the slides for me. So um, looking at the next slide, just as a background, just this is a, a summary 
of the overall uh, suppression rates uh, in Marawi for different age groups. But as we can clearly see, the suppression rates among children are much, much, much lower than their adults, both the children and the adolescents. This is the national picture, and this is the data as uh, um, which we, have, we got uh, by the end of, of June. So, but even from the program uh, data, uh, we, it is the same trend. And uh, when it comes to children, actually there's no much difference in terms of the suppression rates between uh, females and males with very minor uh, differences uh, uh, observed for the age group of 15 to 19. But overall, uh, the, the suppression rates are much lower. And uh, we have closely looked at this and um, we know, especially when it comes to the number of the children that are, are failing, almost close to uh, 65 to 70% of the children uh, on NRTIs. So I think I wanted to uh, mention this because in one, some of the slides we shall see where we're using different uh, regimens and uh, the suppression rates are set different. And um, as a, a information for a information from the period of June uh, to July, actually we noticed overall suppression rates in the country improving. And uh, we are still discussing even at the national level whether this could be actually attributed to DTG because we started using DTG uh, in January. Why we are saying that there used to be a big gap between females and males. The suppression rates among the females, even the others, uh, for the males, the suppression rates uh, were much lower. But for, uh, for the period of June and, and, and September, we see that the gap has been crossed between the females and, the, uh, and, and males. So we think uh, having started implementing DTG in January uh, could be contributing to the uh, improved um, overall suppression rates. Next slide, uh, Salah. So, uh, based on that, uh, the gap we have seen there is big disparity between other children and the um, adults. Where there's a clear need for us definitely to have targeted or client-centered um, approaches to make sure that we improve service delivery for our um, children and the uh, adolescents. So one of the key thing, uh, th things we are looking at is both increasing the accessibility and utilization of at least the available drug regimens, and I shall elaborate on that. But looking at the prompting switching of students to infectious regimen, both for the first and the second line, like I said, 65 75% of the children that are failing um, are on NR, 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 NRTIs. Of course, going beyond that and having child management, of course, for our children and uh, adolescents. And that's why we are now that this differential service delivery models, and I will highlight a few of them. Where we are looking at uh, seeing the mothers and the, their infants uh, together, having synchronized appointment, and they are being seen together. And this mainly is for the uh, stable uh, uh, patients. I'll, I'll use the, stable, uh, the word stable loosely. And we have, coming up with, we also have the pediatric specific ART clinic day, days, whereby in a selected number of sites supported by EGPAF, maybe I should have said EGPAF uh, currently supports 179 uh, sites across all the, the nine districts. And we have um, um, selected sites that are providing pediatric specific, specific ART clinic days. And this one of the driving force for us to have these uh, clinics are the sites where we have um, EGPAF supported uh, clinical officers that actually provide the consultation. Um, then we have, like we saw uh, from um, Eswatin and what Anna mentioned before, we have the family clinic days, and these are basically scrutinizing family clinic days, but mainly here we are targeting uh, children or adolescents that uh, have high viral load, and then we see them as in um, with their parents, guardians, and actually uh, siblings. So family clinic days for us mainly are for the patients or ch uh, the children or adolescents with high viral load. And then we have the earlier clubs or sexual uh, support groups for the adolescents. Um, although we have a few numbers, for example, there could be nine and they see a sibling, uh, a sister or a brother attending um, 
uh, area club or successful support group and they also want to join, but in 95% of the um, uh, children, basically are the adolescents between 10 and 19. Next slide. So, so going into um, specific uh, uh, the, more, uh, the uh, approaches we talked about, here we are, because I, we said um, 65 to 70% of our children that are failing uh, on um, NLRTIs. Um, so we have selected sites that are using uh, pellets, and this is according to the national guidelines. Uh, at the national level, we have uh, 23 facilities that are using pellets, and these were selected based on the volumes or the number of uh, children uh, they have um, on ART. Of the 23 facilities, EGPAF is supporting um, eight, eight facilities of those. And uh, so the numbers we have are for those selected sites. And uh, even though we are talking over eight sites, not every child that is uh, propagating the ART or is on ART on those facilities it gets pellets. The criteria is for the children to, be, to receive uh, pellets the catchment area of that facility. So it could be the same facility having pellet, giving pellets, but you find probably even maybe the majority of the patients of the children are not are receiving pellets if they are not coming from that uh, the catchment area of that facility. So that's why the numbers of the uh, children here receiving pellets are slightly uh, lower than probably what you might be exp expecting. So we are trying to eight facilities out of the um, uh, 23 at the national level, or eight facilities out of the 179 egg supported sites. As we can see, overall, uh, the retention for the um, under three um, recipients of care at 12 months, we can see the retention rate is 83% compared to 74%. Uh, uh, Maybe I should have said overall, the retention rate at the national level is about 77% uh, on, on average. And uh, the reason why it, it, uh, uh, we are saying this, because there is additional kind of support, and that was the criteria of selecting sites. Actually, it's only sites that uh, are supported by the implementing partners that uh, provide parents because the understanding was as implementing partners would provide additional support. So these are the same sites where we have, for example, if we have a clinical office or a linkage nurse, and probably getting additional support from the uh, sexual counselors. Then when we look at this um, uh, viral, uh, uh, viral, viral suppression rate, it is not surprising, of course, we know um, that uh, those children that are in Paris, it is expected that they will have uh, at least they'll have a high, uh, high, uh, viral, uh, high viral suppression rate. And as we can see, we're having 83% of the, for the ch uh, children on pellets uh, compared to 53% for the children that are on other uh, regimen. So again, which speaks a lot in terms of uh, wow, how, how we need to quickly transition or make sure that we transition the children that uh, or to the more efficacious uh, regimen. And then the numbers, of course, are certainly lower because even by the time we capture this information, not all of them had already received the, uh, the viral res results. So that's why there's some, a, bit, a little bit of a discrepancy between the numbers of, uh, regarding the viral suppression and the re retention. So some of them are trained in care but have not yet, have not yet received their results. Uh, next slide. So um, this is the uh, mother infant prayer clinics uh, we talked about from the senior health facilities, from the selected uh, uh, districts um, that are supported by, by EGPAF. And we say, uh, specifically looked at these uh, districts because um, in our program, for all the patients we have um, on ART or the uh, live, individuals living with HIV, the two combined districts out of the nine districts, they contribute to about 58% of all the uh, patients we have on, on ART. Therefore, that's why we only picked the screen sites in this acceleration of the scale up uh, dis, uh, districts. But we can clearly see um, in terms of the uh, retention, um, 
we are talking about 84% retention uh, for the um, uh, sites for children in the sites that we are ha having uh, mother infant uh, uh, clinics compared to 59% uh, to the sites that don't have mother infant uh, clinics. And this 59% but largely it also corresponds to overall sites and I mean suppression rate for, uh, as we saw in previous slides for the sites that uh, either don't have pediatric um, uh, specific days and, uh, and we shall also be seeing when it comes to also for the teen club sites with or without you realize that this number corresponds to also to the uh, retention and suppression rates for the sites that don't have additional um, up, inter, uh, in approaches or intervention but uh, which we are now looking at as DSD and these sites what we are doing just see uh, introducing while beyond having the additional support in terms of the health support line care providers, we are having uh, additional that uh, longitudinally follow up uh, these payers. And also we have assigned or we have dedicated uh, care and treatment office. Facility. Um, in Canada side, now we have access to the national Robot monitoring uh, system where we can download the results on waiting for the for, uh, for the national system. So our care and treatment officers can download the results and actually um, have track the patients that need to be. Next slide, Salah. Okay, um, this is uh, now because we know uh, again it comes uh, children. So we have, um, uh, as I said earlier, on selected sites where we have uh, dedicated pediatric clinic days, uh, which are run by um, our care treatment officers, linkage nurses, with the uh, support from other facility staff. As we can see, in terms of the uh, suppression because this is an intervention that was started around March, but we can see, of course, here we are looking at different uh, ART cohorts. But since we started having pediatric ART clinic days um, in those uh, supported facilities, we can see that uh, the suppression has progressively uh, improved. And the rationale with this, for these pediatric clinic days, um, we're trying to, the sites have set aside. Uh, maybe a light clinic days where they can provide a support or have enough time to um, weigh these children, look at their doses, adjust their doses, doses accordingly, and provide um, case, uh, appropriate case management for, uh, for these uh, children. So, and we can see the trend uh, we have, we started from maybe around 61%. Uh, now, as of end of September, in the same facilities, uh, the virus suppression rates then now it's about 89 uh, percent. I think the, sec the second last slide, Salah, which basically will be, we are talking about the high viral load clinic, as I said earlier alone. This is, um, uh, this is some, we started with only six sites, but as I speak, we have scaled the intervention or the model to uh, current to 32 sites. So here, what we are looking at, is the management of children with high viral load. Like I said earlier on, we have 65 70% of the children on NLRTIs. But beyond um, being on NLRTIs, of course, there are some other um, barriers that uh, or factors that could, uh, were contributing or are contributing to the low viral, uh, viral suppression rates among children. But here, what we are looking at, we are looking at the cascade and the, for the children that come with high viral load. And our uh, looking at the uh, bar, maybe number two, the numbers in Lord, we there's no big difference. But when you look at the numbers specifically that completed enhanced adherence counseling, compared to February uh, 2019, um, we had 62% of the children with high value load that were in that we had we are seeing in the facilities and had completed uh, a, um, enhanced adherence counseling. But as of September, we have 82% um, of the children that completed enhanced adherence counseling. 
And we'll also when we look at the children that received um, after their inheritance, uh, inheritance counseling that had their repeat viral load and received, received their results, we see an improvement of 17% from 70% to 87%. For those that uh, were confirmed with high um, or as treatment failure, we can see, of course, uh, this is not uh, necessarily good news to say that uh, they were 60, they are now 85%, but overall the numbers, were, I think, uh, looking at the numbers that were enrolled in, in, in um, high viral load clinic, and the numbers completed. So this is again for us good. But the main, uh, as long as we, now we address the the challenges and looking at them, that 99% of these uh, children that had confirmed treatment failure were switched uh, to second line. Which, um, uh, as I said, even if uh, the enhanced adherence counseling is good, but if the reason for failing or for the initial high viral load is less efficacious arrangement, they, um, even when we do the adherence counseling, we repeat the viral load, the results, uh, we shall still have high viral load. And this um, family model clinics, again, uh, for high volume sites, uh, we have dedicated team, including psychosocial uh, counselors and uh, care and treatment officers. They also, in some of the facilities, they are supported by our district technical officers. They have scheduled days they can go and provide direct um, service delivery uh, during the fam uh, family uh, model clinic. The next slide um, on the, uh, for the teens, the, um, we can basically, I can summarize this in the we can see for the children, uh, uh, sexual groups or uh, clubs, we can see, I say 0 to 14, like, but I said, we maybe we just call it 0 to 14 because we have like four children that are, are below 10, but ideally the area, uh, the teen clubs for us, uh, for children, for children between 10 and 19. We can see when these are the same sites, we're looking at the children from the same facilities, uh, but comparing uh, those that are in the uh, sexual clubs and those that are not in the clubs. And we can see between uh, 0 to 14, we have a separation rate big, uh, 72 percent compared to 35 percent for those that are not in the club. And when we also look at the adults, adolescents between 15 to 19, we can see the difference, which is about 70 percent versus uh, 31 uh, percent. And we run this uh, Sexual support groups on Saturdays, and they are all supported by EGPAF um, and collaboration with some of uh, our teen, teen uh, peers and also some of the sexual counselors we have. And this, in these clubs, we, it is not beyond air three fields. We do sexual, individual counseling or sexual support groups, and also we have what we call. Um, Pray therapy, so the people they come, they play the games as part of the uh, sexual groups, and of course there are some sessions, the curriculum they and un, uh, they undergo uh, each time they call, they come to the for these uh, meetings or, or gatherings, and on a quarterly basis we have the guardians also uh, uh, attending, so that we can also uh, involve them more closely in supporting their their their, their, their adolescents or their children. So our as uh, I'll go to the last slide, um, Salam. Uh, here, it's almost what we've talked about. The only thing I can, or I'm going to um, uh, mention is that the overall, re both retention and suppression for the um, uh, sexual skin club members is much higher than those uh, that are not in the clubs across all the age groups. In conclusion, uh, in, on the next slide, I think we have learned a few uh, things. Um, one, we know we need to quickly uh, transition. We need to optimize the, our drug regimens. Therefore, we need to uh, transition our, ch our children, whom we already know almost uh, we have a huge number that we need to transition to, know, uh, to parents. But in, the good news is that at least we have received our granules and the that would be a, a phased approach, but we are already out of the additional 20 sites that will be using uh, pellets, EGPAF is supporting 10 of those sites. So we are, we are looking at, so we shall be having about uh, almost 20 sites that will be uh, using either pellets or granules that are supported by EGPAF. And then these models, especially the social clubs, they can easily be scaled up. And we have, um, even family model clinic, we have scaled them up 
although we may need, we learned that we, may, we need some dedicated and skilled cadre or the team um, to, for us to uh, successfully uh, roll out or scale up these uh, models. One question I think we are asking ourselves, even when we talk of the DSDs, especially for the successful cl uh, uh, clubs or team uh, club members, I think we also need to start, we are trying to look at uh, splitting the clubs, because even within the clubs, we have what I may call the stable and probably unstable uh, ad uh, adolescents. Therefore, even though it is one club, but we, need, we are looking at having the fast and slow track so that those that are uh, unstable, we can um, probably uh, we need to see them more frequently. And those that are stable, we can see them maybe after every three months, although the national guidance usually the cutoff for the uh, six months is 24 years. So we may, the best we can go will be uh, three months for the, for the stable ones. Thank you. Fantastic. Alan, thanks so much for that extremely interesting presentation. There are actually a number of questions in the Q&A box, um, but we will get to those questions at the end. So again, if you have questions, please continue to type them into the Q&A box. Alan, please go ahead and review those and you'll be able to answer them during the discussion period. So thanks again to everyone. Um, so now, um, before we do go to discussion, I'm going to be asking um, Hillary Wolf to speak. Hillary is the ESCAC um, Senior Technical Advisor for Pediatric Care and Treatment, and she'll be providing um, some PEPFAR perspectives on DSD for children and adolescents. So Hillary, thanks again for joining us, and over to you. Thanks so much, Jen, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak today. I think this is such an important topic um, and very timely, and uh, you know, I think the the presentations that have come before me really lay out some of the um, opportunities and the challenges. And so, um, you know, I think this has been something that's been really key is a new section in our upcoming club guidance for 2020. So I'm excited to share um, what sort of our policy perspective is on this. Next slide. Okay. So specifically, um, Unfortunately, and we don't have enough time just to talk about the first 90 in relation to DSD um, during this presentation, but wow, that is very important. But I, I think the way that we're framing our COP guidance is really to how we can use DSD um, in families and children and adolescents to improve retention and adherence. And so we'll talk about that at Pacific Cascade today. Um, and so we all know that there's barriers um, that include issues to access, convenience, stigma, confidentiality, um, and belief systems. And so we really have to untangle these specific issues for each family and address them directly in order to improve outcomes um, and really make it, as, as Anna said, a patient-centered. Um, so there are multiple DSD models that can provide critical solutions to improve retention and adherence barriers. And this is, these are things that we're these are models that we really are encouraging our programs to, to implement um, with fidelity as quickly as possible. Um, so some of the um, main principles of family-centered care that I just wanna highlight are making sure that a parent and child um, are, have aligned clinical appointment dates, ARV pickup dates, viral lab, dates um, and preventing treating for infection comorbidities and also psychosocial support needs. Um, it's really important that we break these up into different items because um, people come to the healthcare center obviously for so many different reasons and we can't just say, well, you know, you can come whenever, like it's fine. We have to make sure that it actually works out so that they are only coming once for each thing and not multiple times for each family member. Um, and then it's really important to utilize OBC and community programs to provide a comprehensive support to the whole family. Um, so just, I, I really appreciate what Anna said about adolescents um, because there is a difference between DSD and adolescent friendly care, but there are also some um, interconnectivities. And so I just think it's really important to kind of take a moment to talk about how adolescents are a little bit different um, as they, you know, they have individual needs, but they also play a very important role 
um, with their family and their ability to transition to self-help management. Um, and we need to support caregivers in order to really make sure that appropriate disclosure is occurring to child so that they can um, transition into the self-help management spectrum. Um, and, and so that there is sort of like a, there's an either or where some, some younger adolescents may want to be part of family-centered care while others may really choose to be more involved in adolescent peer support and not be aligned with family visits. And so we have to, there's a nuance that we have to take into consideration. Um, and we need to make sure that the parents are still engaged post-disclosure um, and that, you know, adolescents need that support in order to thrive. Um, okay, so, you know, Alan, I'm really glad that you mentioned this issue with viral load because it's really important. Um, and it's, you know, obviously we all know that it's essential to monitor viral load for all family members um, and that it's really one of the key aspects of differentiated care. Um, so if someone is viral load, load suppressed, then maybe they don't need as much intense care, whereas if they're not, they might need more intense care. But um, one of the major barriers to making, make, making us able to monitor, to, to implement DSD is, is that viral load coverage is not ideal in many countries. And so if we don't know what someone's viral load is, we can't transition them to DSD. Um, and so we, and children are at a much higher risk of poor coverage compared to adults. And so it's depending on the country. So I think it's really important that um, we focus on that, but at the same time, we can't, um, well, we can't prevent children from being eligible to have DSD services because the system doesn't allow them to have a viral load. So we have to weigh both sides of that. So these are just some examples, and I, this is not exclusive of all programs, so I apologize if your program is not on here, but I just wanted to give some examples of how certain DSD models actually cater to stable patients, while others cater to patients who are considered unstable, meaning that they're not virally suppressed. And so that just because you're not virally suppressed doesn't mean, or because you haven't had a viral load because the coverage is low, doesn't mean that you don't qualify to be in certain DSD programs. And I think we really, as we implement newer programs and we create guidelines, we really need to be specific about what is the program, what is the purpose of the DSD program and you know, making sure that there are opportunities for unstable patients as well. So I just wanted to, this is draft, so nothing is finalized yet, but I just wanted to give some, um, a sneak peek on sort of what we're thinking about in terms of the COP20 guidance on MMD in children. Um, so specifically, um, we wanted to focus, on making sure that children have an optimal ART regimen with no dose or formulation changes, changes for at least three months. Um, and when Alan was speaking about the um, pellets issue, you know, it made me think like it has to be, we have to take the optimal ART that we have in a country. Like if a, if a country has not procured the optimal ART and it is not available, then we can't just say, well, at, then children can't be involved in DSD. We have to sort of take it step by step so that we give the children as many opportunities as possible um, to engage in DSD. So they should have no intercurrent, inter, intercurrent illness, including malnutrition. Um, caregivers should be counseled and oriented on age-appropriate disclosure processes, but disclosure should not be a requirement for multi-month dispensing. Um, and making sure that clotrimoxazole is provided with all ART refills so that children who, are, who receive MMD also are receiving clotrimoxazole. Um, and then we sort of break it down by age in terms of where we think um, MMD should occur and how frequently. And so you can sort of see here um, what our thinking is for the different age groups, um, which mirrors a lot of what Anna was saying earlier as well. And more resources obviously can be, find on, be found on that web page. So I was asked to speak a little bit about some what some, I, we foresee some of the challenges to be in country. And I think a lot of people have already expressed some of these. Um, 
but you know, I clearly we've did, had these discussions, some of these discussions about MMD with um, programs and countries, and concerns have emerged. Um, a lot of uh, experts in country feel that fewer clinic consultation visits for children less than five years is, is ideal. It makes them nervous that they're not providing good care. They insisted that um, there should be alignment with immunization clinic monthly visits to monitor weights and health in general. And the thought of them only com coming back after three months was very nerve wracking. Um, and some countries cited that the WHO advanced disease guidance says all children younger than five years old with HIV are considered to have HIV disease, advanced HIV disease. So why would we allow them to um, come less frequently? So um, these are all things that we sort of as a, um, a collective need to sort of figure out how we're going to address. Um, and so, you know, one, I think one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that ARV dose changes for children are actually pretty infrequent beyond infancy, um, and that only three dose changes are anticipated between one year and seven years of age. And so I think this is a really important point that we really need to educate people on because I don't think people realize how infrequent it is. Um, and then other things to discuss, you know, how often do we really need to get weight checks? I don't think uh, after, you know, a year of life, we're not getting monthly weight checks even, even before your life. And specifically, I think this argument about the immunization visit schedule, we actually, after age one, the, the immunization visits are very infrequent. And so I think really sort of like reframing and re-educating what the guidelines are to really see how this is actually possible. And then I think this advanced disease category, we really have to be specific in the language that we use because it really pertains to management around ART initiation, not reinitiation or treatment failure, um, and not ongoing, not, uh, not ongoing successful treatment. So I think like we need to, we're, you know, as a collective group, we have to put out this information so that it becomes clear. And then I think it's really important that we create training and guidance materials to address provider negative attitudes and concerns about DSD and MMD for children and illustrate how family-centered DSD and MMD could be planned, implemented, and managed, including clinical scenarios with adolescents and when one family member is unstable so that people are prepared to deal with these difficult situations that maybe don't have a clear answer at first. Um, and then I think, you know, we really have to strengthen our M&E um, abilities in order to ensure tracking and missed clinic visits and med pickups for all family members and develop tools that can help promote, monitor, and report on uptake. Um, and then lastly, you know, a lot of people have talked about this political will is just so key in changing these country guidelines and how we really need to put pressure on these um, countries to sort of put the family first and really focus on family-centered care. Great, thanks so much, Hillary. Um, and thanks to everyone for those incredibly insightful and extremely interesting presentations. Um, we have a number of additional Q&A um, questions in the Q&A box, so um, panelists, please take a look at those. Before we do open for questions and discussions, I did want to ask Tamanda Talasha from the Committee of African Youth Advisors, or KAYA, from Malawi, for her response. Tamanda, we'd really love to hear your thoughts um, on DSD for children and adolescents um, and your responses to the presentations so far. So, Tamanda, please do go ahead. And Sarah, I actually am not able to unmute her from some reason. So if you could help me unmute her, that would be great. Morning. Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank you very much for holding this wonderful discussion. It is important to my fellow youth living with HIV positive and myself. Thank you for the presentation. Tamandara Rasha is my name from Malawi, S21. Malawi lady by nationality. 10 years living with virus and furthermore, I have vast experience 
cancer in my youth, my fellow youth who are actually positive, to leave positively on their treatment. Furthermore, I was so weak with discord and couple to live happy and support one another. The community of youth advisors, youth African advisors, Kaya, we were brainstorming a group called CAG. CAG is community-based ART groups. And for Malawi, we designed a model called Community Y plus Master. CAG is a group that will deal with problems of the youth and reduce all the fears which the youth have when we transition from our club to adult care. CAG allows a person who can make decisions on his own should be age 15 to 35. We feel very alone and no sick, both six. Each group, each group, each group, CAG consists of six members for easy monitoring. Each member rotate to the facility twice per year to see clinician and to complete routine clinical visit and return to the clinic for their clinical follow-up appointment, even if it is not their turn to collect medication. Thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tamanda. I think that was a really good cap off to providing some insight into how we need to really be framing some of these models of care, as well as kind of making sure that we're giving patients the maximum options possible. Um, so again, thanks to everyone. We now are going to move into the discussion section. Um, and just as a reminder, um, if you are on the computer or on the Zoom app, you can again either ask a question in the Q&A um, chat or um, click star nine to raise your hand and then you'll be mute, um, notified once you're unmuted. And Sarah is going to help do some of the unmuting. So while we're waiting for people to raise their hands, I'm going to start with some of the questions in the chat box. So Diodene from DRC, I believe this question is for Alan, asks Alan, how well does mother infant pair DSD um, model work? Is your experience working well? Which challenges are you facing? And are some mothers coming without their infants and children? So Alan, if you can kind of address that question, that'd be great. Uh, uh, thank you, Jen. Um, I think almost all the questions seem to be mine. Maybe I can even, I can just say. Uh, Please do. Yeah, um, go ahead and ask, <laughs> answer a, a few of them. Okay. Yeah. Um, not in any order, but starting with the one, the, I'll start with the shortest, for example, um, was a question on why do we have few pa patients or children on pellets? And like I said, we are only using pellets uh, in only seven uh, facilities out of the 179 uh, sites we are, we are supporting based on the national uh, guideline. And even within those same facilities, not everybody is eligible for uh, parents based on the national criteria that was set. But of course, we're having discussions uh, how we have learned, because was, that was a pilot phase. Now we have learned, we are, I think we, now we're going to revisit uh, the criteria. So that's why we have fewer children on parents compared to other children that are on, on other regimens. The other one was uh, on... Um, is joining a uh, teen club or uh, PSS club uh, voluntarily or mandatory? Uh, it is not mandatory, Godfrey. That should be Godfrey's question, I think. Um, we have a criteria, one, in terms of the age group, idea, like I said, idea, which we are looking at 10 to 19 years of age. Two, uh, there must have been fully, uh, uh, full disclosure. Three, uh, the parents must assent, and therefore, if the parents uh, don't uh, consent for their children for, uh, to, uh, to join the teen clubs, they don't because there are some other issues. They say, oh, now the, if I allow my child to join the club, they will also know that probably I'm also positive. So there are still some of those few issues. So it is vol voluntarily uh, to have, uh, for those that are joining the, uh, the clubs. Um, there was, I think, a question from... Uh, uh, John, I don't remember, I think, but having family clinic days during weekdays versus family clinic days on weekends. Um, I wouldn't say which one works best, but I think this was the after discussion with the facilities and they chose one of the right days. Usually, uh, um, 
in some of the facilities, they have like four days of reality. So some of them, they chose like the fifth day, they made it a family clinic day to, for them to be able to see uh, family members. So that was the agreement between uh, that we, uh, the choice that was made by the facilities. And on, on the other hand, we're also trying as much as possible to uh, have it in, during weekdays, if we are possible, so that uh, because there are so, already so many activities going on over the weekend, we've talked uh, about the teen clubs, they're happening uh, on weekends. We have about 45 facilities with the teen clubs. So basically having uh, teen clubs on, on the weekends, also family model clinics on, uh, on Saturdays. So there are many activities going on on Saturday. So if the site cho chooses a light clinic day uh, that is working best for them, I think that's, that's okay. That's why the, ch the, that was, that, uh, the choice was made. The last one I think was on... Um, 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 a uh, uh, comment on um, uh, DTG, which I alone said bet that between June and, uh, and September, we're seeing the gap between f females and males uh, in terms of viral, viral suppression is closing. And we're thinking, even uh, at the national level, we're thinking that could be a uh, use of DTG. Uh, and the question was, have we, are we seeing the same trend for the adolescents, uh, among adolescents and youth? Maybe um, uh, one quick comment to make, Start with, uh, for DTG, initially, the, our cutoff was uh, th 30 kilograms. So there's many adolescents, male adolescents, that were not eligible for DTG uh, when we uh, dropped the guidelines. Although we have now revised the guidelines to include um, everybody as long as you're above uh, 20, 20 kilograms. So among the adolescents, I think the numbers are a little bit small to say, to uh, uh, start look, analyzing it the, like the way we also analyzed uh, the suppression rates among male uh, male adults. Uh, I think those were the questions. It looks like you had definitely the bulk of them in the Q and A box. Um, it looks like there is. So thanks again, Alan. Um, if anyone is raising their hand right now, we don't actually see it. So please either chat to us or write your question into the Q&A box. Um, in the meantime, um, I believe Godfrey has a question for Hillary. Um, so he writes, on the draft COP guidelines, the eligibility criteria for DSD for children that no child should have intercurrent illness, including malnutrition. It seems that this may be problematic as a substantial number of children may be undernourished, if not frankly, malnourished. So would undernutrition be a barrier? So Hillary, over to you. So I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, we, I think the way we define malnourished, severe malnutrition and what the, what the need is in terms of frequency of visits, I think maybe needs to be more explicitly stated. Um, I think w in that the meaning, what we were thinking in writing that was that this is actually related to, um, was actually related to, you know, people who need to come to a clinic on a very regular basis because they're severely malnourished. And so obviously we don't want that to be a barrier to kids who wouldn't necessarily need to come on a regular basis. Great, thanks, Hillary. And now I think there's a question that might actually be for all of us, but potentially for Tamanda in particular. Um, so someone writes, what should be done to involve the adolescents in policy making? I am anxious because most of these adolescents living with HIV are just the recipients and not mostly involved in decision making um, uh, Poli uh, with policymakers, and do, they do not involve them at the designing level. Um, so I think really that's a question that all of us should answer, but I wanted to see if, Tamanda, if you wanted to answer that, that first. And again, um, Sarah, I'll ask you to unmute Tamanda. Say it again. So um, there's um, a question, Tamanda, that asks, what should be done to involve the adolescents in policy making? I am anxious because most of these adolescents living with HIV are just the recipients and not mostly involved in decision making with policymakers. The policymakers do not involve them at the designing level. Egg, egg of staff must advocate 
young people living with HIV. Great. I think that's um, a good point. Uh, are there, and I, I agree, I think that we can work together between implementing partners and populations that are affected to really raise the voice and make sure that we're all getting seats at the table. Are there other thoughts from the panelists or from the, um, from the uh, um, participants? Yeah, hi, uh, this, is, this is Wally from WHO. And I just wanted to, to chime in on the, on the comment on um, engaging adolescents. I think it's such a, it's a very important question that, that has been raised on that. And just two things um, that, that I would harp on is on, um, on capacity and on opportunities. So on capacity, I think it's important that we continue to, uh, to involve them with, um, with, with skills and so that they can be able to contribute uh, Along, uh, along the cascade of, of care and along the cascade of programming. But and then on opportunities, it's important that we give them the opportunities as well to thrive. Uh, we cannot continue to say, um, you know, they are too young or they, they can't do this. Uh, and we've seen really good examples of, um, of adolescents and young people who are really taking the lead in, uh, in different countries. So I think giving them the opportunities as well uh, to thrive is, is, is really key as we, as we move forward in meaningfully engaging uh, adolescents. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Wally. And I think that somebody um, from the EGPAF headquarters, Marianne, would like to also comment. So Marianne, over to you. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for whoever gave the question. Um, I know sometimes it seems when we hear presentations, we might not necessarily see how youth were involved in the process of it, but I do think there is a lot more engagement than people maybe realize, and Kaya is one way that we're doing that. Um, so when you hear Tamanda talk about, oh, we're, we're designing CAGs, our community ARC groups, we're talking about that. She's one of 12 countries who put that out there, and when we know community ARC youth groups are so essential for um, older adolescents into young adulthood, we hope that this will be the way that we start to design together. Maybe not with such speed as we've gone in the past. There's such an urgency, right, sometimes with the programs. But I think when we step back and we consult them through the process and they actually help us implement, we know that that's why the results are really good. And, and maybe Tamana is shy to say it, but we know in Malawi those clubs have a lot of youth engagement and they run well because of that. And you can see it in the results. Great, thanks so much, Marianne, for those comments. I, I think that all of those suggestions and comments are very well received. Um, and then we have a, a final question from the uh, Q&A before we see if any other folks have any questions and then we'll, we'll move to the close. Um, so this is from John, an open Q&A. We are beginning to get to a point where identifying HIV positive children is getting harder. Do we have any DSD models focusing on the first 90? And this is a great question. Even if it's for adults that we can learn from to improve positive HIV children identification. I think this is a fantastic question and indeed something we're all facing. Um, so open to both the panelists as well as to the participants. I think one thing that potentially can be learned from adults is looking at how we can make testing a bit more accessible. So especially for children who are in school, um, similar to other folks who have um, employment during the day, maybe making sure that testing can be open at times that are friendly to people who are in school. Um, but I'm sure that there are other folks uh, on the call who can add to that. Um, this is Anna. I wanted to chime in on that question, John. So I think what we are seeing um, for children and adolescents, which is different for adults, is that there are some validated screening tools for children and adolescents for accessing treatment or testing, um, and those have shown good validity. We don't have those for adults, which makes it harder, uh, but we also know that um, some data from different places, in, including in Zimbabwe, showing 
um, testing of, of siblings and of children of adolescents themselves, um, showing good results in terms of identifying um, HIV positive children. Um, and then just to the um, anonymous attendee in the box below in the Q&A regarding the number of months of refills, I think we just need to be careful that we don't necessarily have um, the, the, so the question here is around three month refills versus four month refills and related to school terms. And I think we just need to look at how this is going to relate also to packaging. We understand that there will be a transition to uh, pre-packed bottles that include 90 day supply um, and how this relates to access to six monthly clinical consultations. So I think we, what we do need to be very cognizant of and very aware of as we um, uh, look to make visit schedules and ART refills for um, children and adolescents at school is when exactly those school hol holidays fall. Um, and so I think that's the, the big takeaway point. And then finally, just not to not totally overstep, but acknowledging time's running out, I can see in the main window, there's a question about evidence regarding engagement of CSOs and the implementation. And just wanted to make a huge point, almost the inverse to the point about engaging adolescents in policy, where we most absolutely need to do that. We need to be engaging adolescents and communities and people living with HIV um, at policy and at implementation level. And so I think that we can almost uh, unanimously say that when community-based organizations and when communities themselves are empowered and um, given the funding that they require to provide implementation support that we see really good outcomes. And so we can show that and we need to also highlight that if we want communities to play a role in implementation, uh, we need to make sure that they're adequately resourced and adequately funded. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Anna. Um, and I want to, first of all, thanks all to the panelists um, who have really provided some extremely interesting um, uh, data and thoughts and insights today. And thanks as well to all of the participants for being here, contributing to the discussion and asking all of those insightful questions. I think we've seen that there are examples of DSD models that have data behind them. Um, but unfortunately, we haven't fully scaled them up. So I think this is really a call to all of us to think about how we each in our individual roles can ensure that we are not only creating the policy space, but also implementing with integrity all of these DSD models and making sure that they're adequately resourced and also ensuring that they're modeled along with the um, populations that are affected, including adolescents living with HIV. So thanks again for everyone. I will turn this over for a last word to uh, my co-moderator, Martina Penizato. Thank you, Jen, and thank you everyone really for the great uh, contribution that you provided to this webinar. Um, these presentations were really comprehensive and really taught us how much is happening on the ground. And as Jen said, uh, clearly some of these um, models really need to be taken to scale and need to be adequately supported. And I wanted to circle back to what um, Anna said at the beginning in terms of policy gap and evidence gap. And I think that uh, it's important that implementation remain connected to evidence generation. And so um, acknowledging how much is happening on the ground, we also, as WHO and a normative agency, would really like to remind everyone the importance of documenting your experiences and, and really sharing it to, with a broader audience so that we can use it back to really refine our policies and further advocate for what works and what makes the biggest impact. Um, and with that, I want to also note that obviously uh, this is again just the second webinar of a webinar series that we continue to uh, to host as AIDS Free Working Group. And in doing so, uh, we really invite you to um, to join future webinar. And the next one, uh, for which a date has not been identified yet, will focus on the service delivery framework that our colleagues in UNICEF has led and obviously a lot of other elements attached to how we deliver care to children and adolescents will be touched on. So thank you very much and really looking forward to the next opportunity to interact and learn from what's happening on the ground. Thanks to everyone and goodbye.